joy and gladness again Keep me near I'm desperate for
Without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. 
When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. It's your grace. Good morning and a really warm welcome to Life Destiny Church's Sunday morning service. Welcome to you, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever time of the day or night you listen to this, a very, very warm welcome to you. Well, when I woke up this morning and I looked out the window, uh, the sky was blue, the sun was shining in the sky. It was a beautiful day, but now it's clouded over. I don't want to like down in Harrogate and Maresborough. It is definitely clouded over but have you noticed that the days are getting longer and the sun is getting stronger and warmer 
And uh, you'll notice that there are snowdrops and crocuses growing all over the place. Somebody told me it's a very good year for snowdrops. Why that is, I don't know, but there seem to be gigantic patches of, of snowdrops everywhere and the stray is getting covered with crocuses. It's lovely. Reminds me of that passage in Song of Songs, which I looked up a few minutes ago, which says, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past. And I think uh, there's more than one way of interpreting that at the moment. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The queen of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. But I think there's an awful lot of meaning in that passage. But there is also there an invitation for you. Arise and come with us this morning into God's presence. A place of worship, a, pray, a place of praise and adoration of our great God. And this morning we've got Bethan and team leading worship in a few minutes. Sue is speaking to the children. John is speaking on prayer. We've got a great morning lined up for you. So let's open with prayer. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for yourself. We thank you for your love that is showered upon us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life, for his teaching. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his resurrection and all that that means to us. We thank you now, Lord, also for each other. Even though we have to meet in this strange way, we do thank you for each other. We thank you for this church and we thank you for this time that we are due to have together. We pray now for John and for Sue. We pray for Bethan. We pray your anointing on them. Pray your enabling, your empowering. We pray, Lord, you fill them with your Holy Spirit. We also pray, Lord, for those amongst us who are sick and in need of healing. And we pray now, Lord, you, uh, you shower them with your love, that you reassure them, you wrap your arms of love around them and bring them healing, we pray in Jesus. We pray. Once again, for an end to this pandemic. And now we pray for a, a blessing, anointing on Bethan, on the worship team, on ourselves. We pray that you fill us with your spirit as we come to worship you. We ask all this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said, I didn't hear you. And all God's people said, amen. Bless you. Thank you, Bethan. Over to you now. Thank you.
Oh, worship team. Thank you very much. That was really something special. Um, I, I think I might have mentioned it before, but I know that over recent weeks, the worship team have put in a, a lot of extra work in recording um, several uh, new songs, not necessarily new songs for us, but uh, songs that we've not sung for quite some time. And I think that last one was new, wasn't it? Because uh, it was beautiful, beautiful song. So a big thank you to the worship team, to Bethan and uh, to, to Owen, my, my son has been working with as well to record those songs a big thank you to you for all the extra work you put in it is really appreciated thank you very much we're going over now to kids zone and sue some people said that um, when sue speaks to the children it also helps the adults to get a better grasp of the sermon and um, sue is so um, gifted so anointed um, so used by God that uh, that would not surprise me at all. So, so Sue, looking forward to what you're going to do today. I wonder, is it a cow or a bull by your side or a puppet or just you? Thank you, Sue. children it's Sue again how are you today and um, today we're going to talk about prayer um, I see I've written it up there prayer so let's have a let's have a true or false question time and see if you know a bit about prayer true or false you have to put your hands together and close your eyes when you pray. Is that true or false? Yes, it's false. You can put your hands like this or you can sometimes pray as you're doing your maths at school or when you go back. So the second one, true or false, is... You only can pray at certain times of the day. Yeah, that's false as well, isn't it? You can pray at any time of the day or night. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. You can stop and pray to our Father God. So how do we pray? Well, I'm going to help you with this little thing today. So, we need to think of the three words in pray. Okay? So, the first one is the P. And we start our prayer time off with praise. Because that prepares our hearts to come into God's presence when we pray. So praise God for all he's done, for all he is, and for who he is. And the second one is the R. Ah. And R ah means repent. What does repent mean? Well, repent means the things that we do wrong, the sin in our lives. And repent means that we turn away from the things that we do wrong and ask God to forgive us. It's an action word is repent. We turn away from the things we do wrong so that we don't do them again. And the A is ask. We ask God for the things that we need, for the things that others need. It's not like asking Father Christmas for things. It's a bit more serious than that. Um, but you can ask God for everything that you need or when you're upset and need him to help you. He's always there. And the why, this is a funny word, is yield. Yield. And yield means to stop being busy and to come into God's presence and listen to him and just enjoy being in his presence. So, P-R-A-Y. I wonder if you'll be able to remember that after I finish talking. 
So today's verse is from Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. And it says, always be happy, never stop praying, give thanks whatever happens, that is what God wants for you. So this is the world and all the people in the world. Okay, and this is the prayers of the people all being poured out into the, the world. And guess what happens? Can you see? Oh, it's slow because sometimes prayer doesn't always happen as quickly as we want. Sometimes we're waiting and waiting and waiting, but our prayers all together cause a beautiful thing to with when it reaches God in his heaven. It causes a beautiful rainbow. Isn't that lovely? There, we have such a lovely example of our beautiful prayers to God. That was a good example, wasn't it, of prayer? How beautiful is that rainbow? Let's pray. Father, we use the word prayer, pray, to help us to remember how to pray. So, Father, first we use the word praise, Lord, and we praise you for all your goodness and for all the things that you do. And R is repent, Lord, and that means that we say sorry for our sins and turn away from the things that we do wrong. And A is to ask you, Lord, we ask you to meet all our needs and the needs of those who come to you in prayer. And finally, Lord, we yield to you. We yield to you. And we pray, Lord, that we will find time to spend time with you and listen to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. See you later. Bye. Really special. Thank you very much. And as ever, it's always special when you do something super. That was great as well. And I'm sure that uh, that helped us all and challenged us all as well. Indeed. Thank you very much. You mentioned something about praying while you're doing your maths. Perhaps I should have tried that and I'd have done a lot better, perhaps, with my maths in school. Too late now. Well, we're moving on to, uh, to John Whitehead who's going to speak to us um, on the subject of prayer. What can I say about John that I haven't said in the past, apart from the fact he's dependable and he's reliable, and he's supportive and he's a good man. Um, perhaps you'd learn more if I'd asked uh, Ruth to introduce him instead. Uh, maybe that's what we ought to do in future. But this morning, <laughs> this morning, all you need to know is that he preaches a good, well-researched sermon and his life matches up to what he preaches. He not only talks the talk, he walks the walk as well, as they say. So, John, thank you for being you, John, and thank you for your friendship over the years, and um, thank you also for what you're about to say. Let's pray for you before we hand over to you. Father, I lift up John Whitehead to you, and I just pray your blessing down on him now as he brings your words to us. I pray a real special anointing for him as he deals this subject of prayer. And I pray, Father, that you will this morning speak through him. And I pray also, Lord, that you give us ears that hear and hearts that are willing to respond and obey. And I ask this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, good to be here uh, with you this morning. Um, it wouldn't have worked to get Ruth introducing me. She unfortunately is at work today, so you'd have had a long wait. But uh, I'm sure she'll listen to this keenly afterwards. <laughs> well, I hope she will. How do people view the church? You know, we've started a, a series uh, just a few weeks ago looking at important things in the church. What is important that has to go on in the church for us to be church? 
for us to actually fulfill um, the mission that God's given us. And last week we was talking about evangelism. And this week I'm talking about prayer. But before we get on to that, how do people actually view the church? Do they think we're irrelevant? Do they think we're a waste of time? Do they think we're critical of anything they enjoy? Do they think we do some good works, but they don't accept our beliefs? Do they think we're insignificant or boring? Why do people have these sorts of ideas about the church? Perhaps it's because to some extent they may even be right. But that's not the way God planned it. And it's not the way that we saw church when we studied the book of Acts recently. So what's the difference between the church as it was in the book of Acts and the church as it has become? And what's the solution? Let's be clear. I'm not condemning the church. I'm not being critical this morning. Over the last 50 years, I have seen the church across the world changing for the better. And more importantly, I've seen an acceleration today in what God is doing in the church. Much of the solution is already in place, but we need to recognize both the problem and the solution if we're to continue changing to become the church that God wants us to be. So please don't see this message as criticism or, or telling off. I believe that the message this morning has been given to me by God to encourage us all to be the church he wants us to be. It will encourage us in our relationship with God, with each other and with the world. And I believe that if we really grasp what God is saying to the church, especially this morning about prayer, and if we really grasp what God is doing in the church these days, we can enjoy the greatest adventure of our lives. So let me remind you what the church was like that we uh, read about recently in, as we studied the book of Acts. Well, the leaders were preaching boldly and thousands were saved in just one day. All of the believers devoted themselves to four things. The apostles teaching, they didn't have the whole Bible, so they were reliant on word of mouth. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship with each other, not just meeting, but sharing and helping each other in need. The breaking of bread, which keeps the death and resurrection of Jesus central in our thinking and in our lives, and to prayer and worship, which they did daily in the temple and, e and in each other's homes. Many signs and wonders were happening in the church, initially through the leaders and then through others. And this is a, a significant point, I think. It says in Acts 2, they enjoyed the goodwill of all the people. People liked them. They weren't seen as irrelevant. They weren't seen as boring. People listened to what they said. They didn't necessarily agree. And later persecution arose. But when the church was first formed, People liked them. They enjoyed the goodwill of all the people and people were being saved every day. And I believe that God is restoring the church across the world in that way. So how do we play our part? Well, clearly, we need to be devoted, as the early believers were, to the study of the Bible and teaching. We need to be devoted to each other. We need to be devoted to the breaking of bread and we need to be devoted to prayer, which is my topic this morning. So we're inward looking by supporting each other. We're outward looking in reaching out to share the good news of the gospel in words and in action. And we're upward looking, fixing our minds on things above, fixing our eyes on God, being filled with the Holy Spirit and expecting God to move supernaturally through his church. So today we're focusing on prayer, and this is where many people start to switch off. Why do we often find prayer so difficult? Why are prayer meetings so poorly attended? As soon as we know the sermon's going to be about prayer, many of us start to feel guilty. We all know we should pray more. We all know we're supposed to. So today I want to encourage us in prayer, both personally 
and in groups. So why is it that we have a lack of enthusiasm for prayer? Why is it that we are tempted to spend more time with the TV than we are with God? I believe you know, there's two main reasons for this. The first reason might surprise you. I think it's the fault of Amazon or eBay. See, if I want something that I can afford, I can go to the Amazon app, I choose what I want, I know what it's going to cost me, and I know when it's going to be delivered. We are used to getting what we want quickly and with little effort. But prayer isn't like that. Sometimes God does answer prayer immediately. But when I go to God for something, I don't know when he will answer. I don't know how long I will have to pray. And I don't know what it will cost me. See, often God uses us to answer our own prayers. If I ask God for something, he might require me to do something. He might require me to sacrifice something. He might, he might keep me praying for months before I see the answer. But our culture of expecting immediate results has made us less accustomed to waiting patiently on God. And I think the second reason why we lack enthusiasm for prayer is that we've lost sight of what it's all about. We are in a battle. In our whole lives, we are surrounded by things that we can see, things that we want, things that we want changed, the needs of others, uh, political, national and international problems that need fixing. We see politicians that we may like or dislike. We see people, friends and family that we want to see saved. We might see the dwindling bank account or the escalating bills and, and much more besides. But these are just things that we can see. We need to focus on the things that we can't see with our physical eyes. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 to 12. It says this, a final word, that's Paul's word, not mine, I've got a bit more to say yet. But Paul said, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. What a powerful passage. This is why prayer is so important in the church. The church is called to battle against an unseen enemy, the devil and all his demonic forces. See, Jesus defeated the devil when he conquered death but the devil has not yet been destroyed and is active in the world. The devil knows he's defeated. He knows that Jesus won the victory, but he is active in the world today and he wants to defeat you and I. The passage that I just read started by saying that we should be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We, you and I, should be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. How do we do this? I think there's three things. Personal prayer and Bible study will strengthen our faith, so that mustn't be neglected. Meeting with other believers will both teach us and encourage us. And to be strong in his mighty power, where do we get this power? It's by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said we would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. So that's how we are strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, through personal prayer and Bible study, meeting with other believers and being strong in his mighty power, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we're focusing on prayer today, but it's very difficult to take prayer in isolation um, because everything we do as a church or as individuals is, is based around prayer and Bible study and fellowship with God and with each other and reaching out to the world. So 
I'm focusing on prayer, but we cannot ignore the importance of Bible study and meeting with other believers to strengthen us and encourage us. So let's just come back to this. The church is involved in a spiritual battle, and we are told in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Did you realize that the devil has strategies to defeat you? That the devil has strategies to defeat not just you, but your family, your kids and the church? We need to wake up to the fact that the devil has strategies that he uses against us. We need to wake up, get angry and start fight fighting. The future of those you love is at stake here. The devil will try to defeat you, but one thing he can't do is take away your salvation. That is secure in Jesus. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So we don't need to be frightened. We're on the winning side. Jesus has already won the victory. So what are the devil's strategies? Well, I don't know all of his strategies, but I can tell you a few. The devil will always aim to make you neglect prayer because that's what connects you with God. It's where much of the church's battle has to take place. Prayer is supernatural. Prayer invites God to fight. The devil's main strategy is to stop you praying. And that applies to us personally, and it applies to the church corporately. He doesn't want us strong in the Lord. So the devil's main strategy will be to cause us to neglect prayer. The second strategy that the devil uses is to cause us to neglect Bible study. Because the devil knows God's promises to you better than you know them yourself. And he particularly hates the bit at the end where he gets destroyed. And the third thing that the devil will try to stop us doing is meeting with other believers. He doesn't want you to be encouraged. He doesn't want you to be built up. He doesn't want you to be used by God. And he just loves to cause disunity in the church. So the devil has these strategies that he's using. And the main place where we fight the devil's strategies is in prayer. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6 um, and read from thir verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armour so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body armor or the breastplate of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is a popular passage for Sunday school lessons, isn't it? You know, the children get this picture of a Roman soldier and they put all the bits of armor onto the soldier. But as we come to pray, we need to remember this armor. Briefly, let's just run through them. I could do a whole sermon on each of these, but just so that we understand what we're talking about. The belt of truth. What is the truth? It's the truth of what God says about you. You know, it was once said that, I can't remember who said it, but truth is actually just God's opinion. Whatever God thinks about anything, that is truth. So when we put on the belt of truth, we think about the truth of what God says about us. However you feel, God says you are an overcomer. You are chosen. You are loved by God. You are a child of God. You are more than a conqueror. These truths are things that we need to be aware of. The belt of truth is the truth of what God says about you. It's who you are. Then there's the breastplate of righteousness. 
Well, we are righteous because our sins are forgiven. We need to confess our sins. 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we stand before God righteous, the breastplate of righteousness. Then there's the shoes of the gospel of peace. See, we know we have peace with God because we have been forgiven. We have been accepted. He has told us we are his children because we have believed. So we know the peace of God because we have peace with God. And then there's the shield of faith. It's our faith in God and his promises to us that protect us. We know the promises of God. We can have faith that he will fulfill his promises because God never, ever breaks a promise. And then there's the helmet of salvation. Yes, we can feel in our heart that, that we're forgiven and that we're right with God, but we also know it in our heads. That's where the brain is for, for most of us. The helmet protects the head, the helmet of salvation. We know we are saved because we have believed in Jesus and his work on the cross. And then there's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I was taught a bit of an error in Sunday school lessons when I was a kid. I was taught that there's the there's, there's six pieces of the armor of God. There's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And I was taught that the first five were about protecting me. They were armor to protect me. But the sword, the last one there, was the offensive weapon. It's what we used to, to win the battles. There is some truth in that. We need to know the word of God so that we can rely on the promises of God uh, when we're praying. And we should know the word of God thoroughly. It should be one of our priorities. But you see, verse 17, which refers to the sword of the spirit, doesn't end the paragraph. And when Paul wrote this, it was a letter. It didn't have the verse number. So let's read it again, taking into account that last verse, starting at verse 17, then put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too, says Paul. Ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. So did you see that? Prayer is the offensive weapon. The whole passage about putting on the armour of God is to prepare us for the real battle that will take place when we engage in prayer and action. Note also that, that Paul is asking them to pray for him as he preaches the good news. Our evangelistic activities, when we outreach as a church in whatever way we're doing it, whether it's through the living room cafe, meals for the homeless, food bank, wh whatever we're doing, our evangelistic activities need to be soaked in prayer, just as everything else we do. See, God wants to impact the world with us. There is a spiritual battle going on in the world. And yes, we can do a lot of good by treating the symptoms, relieving poverty, caring for the hurting, befriending the lonely, feeding the hungry. We absolutely must do those things. Wynne was talking about them last week. We must be doing those things. But to make a real difference, we must fight against our real enemy, the devil. And we do this first and foremost in prayer we also doing it we also do it by having the right attitudes and the right beliefs by living righteously and with love and compassion but first and foremost we do it through prayer god could handle things without us being involved but god has chosen to have you and i partner with him are you ready to pray and make a difference? 
See, our prayers really do make a difference. This is the great adventure that God calls us to take part in. We can impact our society. We can impact our world. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples of things that I've experienced where God has made huge differences as a result, direct result of prayer. I can remember at one time there was a, a club in this area that regularly had strippers performing there. I never went in, but I knew of it. And then it became a business that promoted occult healing and teaching. A few of us gathered in a, in a building opposite to pray against what was going on in there. These things shouldn't be allowed in our town. We prayed that the business would close and that the building would be used for a good purpose instead. Within weeks, the business closed and the building was taken over by a housing association to provide low cost housing. And the icing on the cake, if you like, the project manager for the housing association was a leader that we knew from a church in Leeds. God answered our prayer. That evil business was closed and the building was put to good use. On another occasion, there was a, a business promoting witchcraft as a harmless bit of fun, which it's not. And we had a friend of David Thompson um, visiting, um, who was a church leader in Ghana. I think his name was Emmanuel Bodway, if I remember rightly. And in Ghana, voodoo and witchcraft, witchcraft is much more commonly seen than in this country where it tends to be hidden. He joined us in praying, and I can remember clearly what he prayed. He prayed that the business would change, but that the employment of the staff would be protected. And again, within weeks, there was a massive rainstorm and localized flooding, which damaged some of the buildings, only minor damage, but it did destroy a lot of their stock. And the owner, instead of deciding to, to replace it all, he decided to sell the business. And the new owner, the purchaser, placed much less emphasis on witchcraft, etc., And no staff lost their jobs. God answered prayer. He changes society as a result of our prayer. We can make a difference by praying. I don't know why God waited for us to pray before he acted. But on both of those occasions and many other occasions I can think of as well, God could have stepped in, but he was waiting for us, his agents on earth, to pray before he acted. You and I can have an impact on our area if we pray for God to act. That's the prayer adventure that God invites us to participate in. Sometimes it can be a quick prayer when you see something as you're walking through town. Sometimes it requires persistence and sometimes it also requires action. Sometimes you can pray on your own. Other times you need to pray together with other people or even the whole church. Let's just take a commercial break at the moment. Two resources that I would suggest you look at if you don't already. The first is the prayer bulletin that Win, uh, Lucy, Kevin and I do every morning uh, on Facebook. There's a Facebook group called A Time to Pray, the church's response to COVID-19. That will give you some things to pray about. We have a different topic each day. It'll give you some things to pray about. So if you're not already part of that group, look for it on Facebook or contact one of us and we can point you in the right direction. It's called A Time to Pray, the church's response to COVID-19. And there are Christians across the town and in fact, in, in other parts of the world that regularly listen to that brief uh, message every morning and join us in praying if you want something to help you get praying then i suggest you start with that also there's the new initiative that win has already published on facebook um, that's going on around the country it's called try praying and that encourages us to pray but it also encourages unbelievers to try praying it's, uh, we're, we're taking part in this initiative in this area. Um, you can find on our Facebook group um, a link to 
the Try Praying initiative so you can see what it's all about. So have a look at that. That will help us to really put into action what we're talking about this morning. Okay, what should we be praying for? The simple answer is whatever God places on your heart. Perhaps you see a neighbor struggling with a family problem. Perhaps you know of someone who is ill. Perhaps you have loved ones who don't know God yet. Perhaps you've read of an injustice in the newspaper. Perhaps you see a television program that you know is not pleasing to God. Perhaps you see a politician making unjust decisions. Perhaps you hear of a friend losing their job or, or you know of someone in financial difficulty. Whatever God places on your heart, you can pray by yourself. You could, if appropriate, pray with the person. Or you could pray with other Christians or ask other Christians to join you in praying for that individual or, or that situation. Whatever God places on your heart. Now, I don't consider myself an expert, but I've learned some lessons over the years, which I hope might be helpful to you. I have found that the more time I devote to being with God in private prayer, listening at least as much as speaking, then the more attuned I become to what pleases and displeases God, and therefore what I should be praying about. The more time I spend privately with God, the more I become aware of what pleases and displeases him. So that's what I should be praying about. Secondly, before I pray for anyone or anything, I always ask God how to pray and what to pray for. You see, I don't want to be praying for anything that is against his will. But likewise, I want to make sure that I am praying for the right outcome. God's ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He knows best. So I want to know from him what I should pray for. And thirdly, I have found that I need to be willing to be the answer to my own prayer. Perhaps when I pray for someone in need, God's going to send me to help them. Perhaps I have to write to my MP or even the prime minister. I've done that before. Or maybe the managing director of business. Maybe when I start praying about something, God's going to show me that I have to devote time to a project to actually solve the problem. So when I pray, when you pray, we need to be willing to be the answer to our own prayer. Sometimes God will act supernaturally without us doing anything. Other times he will call us to action. And we need to be prepared for that. Prayer isn't just a theoretical exercise. It's not just a routine that we need to go through each day. Prayer changes things and prayer often changes us. Prayer isn't just asking God for things. It's listening to what he has to say to us as well. So it can have a huge impact on our lives. Some people find it helpful to have lists of things that they want to talk with God about. Personally, I don't. I prefer to ask God to show me what I should be praying about and then listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you've not prayed like this before, expecting big results, start with something small and exercise the faith that you have. Faith is a bit like muscles. If you exercise them, they grow. And it's the same with faith. As you see God answer prayer, your faith will grow and you can move on to praying for bigger things. Prayer is one of the essential activities of the church. So please pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for the church. Pray for your family. Pray for your locality. Pray for your nation and pray for the world. But rely on the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what God says to you when you come to him in prayer. And pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert 
and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know, one of the uh, great warriors of the faith that lived in Bradford back in the uh, first half of the last century, uh, Smith Rigglesworth. Some people came to Smith Rigglesworth and said, you're a man of faith and miracles. You've raised people from the dead. You've cast out more demons than we've had hot dinners. Tell us, how long do you pray every day? And Rigglesworth replied, I don't ever pray longer than 20 minutes. And they were surprised, you know, what, 20 minutes? And he said, yes, but I never go 20 minutes without praying. <laughs> that verse said, pray at all times. Prayer isn't about how much time we spend in it. It's about lifestyle. As we go through our day, constantly praying about everything that we're doing, having that conversation with God and listening to his prompting. Finally, let me just read to you from 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 1 to 3. It says this, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Saviour who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So let's be committed both individually and together as a church to thwart the strategies of our enemy, to see our local area transformed as God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. God bless you. Wow, John. Uh, do you know, when, when we are together in, in, in person in our building and somebody preaches and it's a good preach, we usually, we usually uh, show our appreciation by a round of applause. So wherever you are, oh, join me and let's give John a quick round of applause for that because that was excellent. That was brilliant, Thank John. You, there was just so much in it. I, I think, to be honest with you, folks, you could listen to that sermon another half dozen times. And every time you listen to it, you would learn something new. You'd hear something new. Um, and you could probably listen to it for far more than half a dozen times as well and still learn something new. So, John, many thanks for dealing with that subject um, as, as well as you have done. Superb. Thank you. Well, well we're, we're coming to the end of our, uh, our service for this week. And I, and I hope that... Um, through everything we've done through the, the, the worship and through the, the children's uh, word and John's word as well. Um, you've really enjoyed our time together and it's built you up and it's encouraged you and it's, it's, it's set you up nicely for the week to come. Um, when, whenever I speak to anybody from LDC, I get asked the question always, especially um, during the last couple of weeks, when are we going to meet together again in person? When can we go back into our building to meet properly? Well, um, we are watching the infection rates, the infection figures um, carefully. And, and if things continue to go in the right direction, we would hope to meet together in person uh, sometime during April. I'm, I'm, not, I'm deliberately not putting a date on that because we've got to be flexible and we've got to watch the figures, watch the, the infection rates, et cetera, et cetera. But um, Believe me, we, we want to try and meet, um, open up again sometime during April. Um, and if it's got anything to do with me, it'll be sooner rather than later, because um, it is far easier for us to just get in our car on a Sunday morning, drive down to church, open the doors and, and, and get on with things. Um, uh, what we do at the moment with the online thing, Ben, ben Stacy has listened to this, I'm sure, at the moment. And Ben, I want to say thank you for what you're doing to keep us online and keep this service going. But uh, the in-person thing is a lot easier for us, believe me. So we want to move into that as soon as possible. Keep an eye on Facebook uh, group page, our group page, um, for more information as arises. But uh, we're working towards what I've just said, um, meetings sometime during April as soon as we possibly can. And remember, the winter's passed. The winter's passed. The rains are over. The flowers are appearing on the earth and the season for singing has come. I want to finish by praying over you. John's been talking about prayer and that's been our subject for today. I want to pray this over you and it's a prayer that I'm taking from the New Testament, from Ephesians chapter 
3 verse 14, verse 16 rather, chapter 3 verse 16, it's a prayer for the Ephesians, but I think God will permit us to allow it to be a prayer for the people of Starbeck um, and LDC Community Church as well. Here we go. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll speak to you again very soon. Bye-bye.